Good evening. Check, check, hey, hey, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P.
Hello? Okay. We're good. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Santa Clara Unified School District's regular board meeting for Thursday, November 10th. Nice to have you all here. Uh, so we will start with our roll call. Trustee Canova? Here. Trustee Fairchild? Here. Trustee Gonzalez is absent. Trustee Lieberman? Here. Thank you. Nice to see you tonight online. Trustee Lieberman. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee uh, Ryan is absent. And I am here. Can we have the introduction of our interpreter, please? Good evening, board. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Angélica Benítez. Mi compañera Verónica Adams y yo vamos a ser las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la mesa directiva. Esta reunión está siendo transmitida en el canal en español de Zoom. Para escuchar esta sesión en español, oprime el botón que dice interpretación en su pantalla y seleccione el idioma de español. En este tam en menú también tendrá la opción de silenciar el audio original en inglés. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and Trustee uh, Fairchild, would you mind leading us tonight? That's fine. Please Thank stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Next up is our district mission and vision statements. So the mission of Santa Clara Unified School District is to provide equitable, engaging, and innovative educational experiences so that each student thrives in a global society. And our vision is that graduates of Santa Clara Unified School District are resilient, future-ready, lifelong learners who think critically, solve problems collaboratively, and are prepared to thrive in a global society. I'll uh, uh, take a motion to approve the agenda. Motion to approve agenda, Rotterman. Second, Fairchild. Okay, I have a motion from Trustee Rotterman and a second from Trustee Fairchild. Are there any changes that are needed? No, okay, good. Then um, we're doing all roll call votes because we have someone on Zoom this evening. So we'll go ahead and vote on this. Trustee Canova, Trustee Fairchild. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez is absent. <laughs> Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent, and I say yes, so that passes. Uh, we are at five to zero. Great. We are um, about to go into closed session, so before we do that, um, so we are missing uh, public comment before closed session, but I think we're going to do it anyways because we want to do that. So, um, we will, uh, I need a motion to amend the agenda to add public comment for closed motion session. To amend the agenda and add public comment on closed session. Second, Fairchild. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Ratterman, a second from Trustee Fairchild to amend to include public comment before closed session. Um, we'll do a roll call vote. Trustee Canova, Trustee Fairchild. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez is absent. Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Ratterman. Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent and I say yes. So that passes uh, five to zero um, to do public comment. Great. So uh, at this time we will um, take public comment on our um, eight closed session items. So this is a time to speak only on those eight items. Is there anyone in the room who wishes to speak? Okay, is there anyone on Zoom who wishes to speak on our um, public comment items. Now would be the time to raise your hand. If you are um, on the live stream, you need to join the Zoom in order to um, speak. So now would be the time to quickly switch over and raise your hand. Okay, I don't see anyone. Do you see anyone? Okay, then um, we will move on. So in closed session, we'll be talking about B.1, consideration of the recommendation of administrative hearing panel regarding the expulsion of student 111022A.1. Item B.2, consideration of the recommendation of administrative hearing panel regarding expulsion of student 11102B.1. Item B.3, conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation for a special ed placement and services. B.4, public employee discipline dismissal release. B.5, 
public employee appointment of the administrative secretary of a administrative secretary for human resources. B.6, conference with labor negotiators. B.7, public employee performance evaluation of the superintendent. And B.8, conference with legal counsel, one item of significant exposure to litigation relating to a complaint. And we are aiming to be back at seven o'clock or shortly thereafter um, because we have some uh, special guests coming at that time. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Okay, welcome back to open session for Santa Clara Unified's Thursday, November 10th board meeting. Can we have the introduction of our interpreter, please? Good evening, board. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Verónica Arabs Navarro. Angélica Benítez y yo seremos las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la mesa directiva. Esta reunión está siendo transmitida por el canal en español de Zoom. Para escuchar esta sesión en español, oprima el botón que dice interpretación en la parte inferior de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma de español. En este menú también puede seleccionar la opción de silenciar el audio en inglés. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, our report from closed session for item B.1. The Board of Trustees with a motion by Board Member Fairchild and seconded by Board Member Ratterman to accept the recommendation of the hearing officer. The Board in closed session voted six to zero with uh, Trustee Ryan absent to approve the expulsion with a suspended enforcement of student 101421, no. Yeah, 101421A.1. Is that really the right student? No. I don't think it is. Okay, let me go back. Uh, sorry, let me read it again. The Board of Trustees with a motion by Board Member Fairchild and seconded by Board Member Ratterman to accept the recommendation of the hearing officer. The Board in closed session voted six to zero to approve the expulsion with a suspended enforcement of student 111022A.1. Okay, item B.2, in the expulsion case um, of student 111022B.1, the, I didn't read this whole thing right. I have to start over, my apologies. We'll get this right. Item B.1, in the expulsion, you know, it's my last meeting as board president, I'll, I'll get it right. In the expulsion case of student 111022A.1, the administrative hearing panel recommends that student said student be expelled with a suspended enforcement through November 10th, 2023. Student 111022A.1 can apply for reinstatement at the end of the expulsion term, November 10th, 2023. The, 23. The Board of Trustees with a motion by Board Member Fairchild and seconded by Board Member Ratterman to accept the recommendation of the hearing officer voted in closed session six to zero with trustee Ryan uh, uh, absent to approve the expulsion with a suspended enforcement of student 111022A.1. Okay, item B.2. In the expulsion case of student 1102B.1, the administrative hearing panel recommends that said student be expelled with a with a suspended enforcement through November 10th, 2023. Student 111022B.1 can apply for reinstatement at the end of the expulsion term, November 10th, 2023. The Board of Trustees in closed session voted with a motion by Board Member Ratterman and seconded by Board Member Gonzalez to accept the recommendation of the hearing officer. The Board voted six to zero with Trustee Ryan absent to approve the expulsion with a suspended enforcement of student 111022B.1. Okay, item B.3. The Board of Trustees with a motion by Board Member Fairchild and seconded by Board Member Ratterman voted six to zero to approve a placement at a non-public school for the upcoming 22-23 school year and agreed upon assessment fees in resolution of threatened special education litigation for student 11102.2 v2. Financial impact for NPS to be determined once the NPS placement is finalized. Additional agreement um, financial impact is $5,400. Item B.4, the board received information. Item B.5, the board received information. Item B.6, the board received information and gave direction. Item B.7, the board discussed. And item B.8, The board um, discussed and gave direction to the board president to work with the superintendent and the board policy committee to potentially update board policies 
and administrative regulations. Okay, moving on, item D.1, recognition of difference makers. So if I could ask Dr. Waddell to go to the podium and for the board to come up front, we have some special recognition tonight. Good evening, President Muirhead, trustees. Um, our Difference Makers program recognizes staff and community members who support our district's core values. These are students first, integrity and ethical stewardship, connected families and collaborative community, equity and social justice, empathy and respect, and world leading and future ready. Difference makers are nominated by the site leadership teams and labor association leadership teams on a quarterly basis to a selection committee comprised of representatives from classified, certificated, and management employee groups. Difference makers are recognized before the board of trustees as they are tonight, where they will receive a certificate of recognition and a difference maker pin. Special feature stories will be released through our district-wide district publications and social media following the announcements. All of the winners and their school principals are here with us tonight. Difference makers, when I say your name, I invite you to stand at the podium with me while I read the recognition. We will then invite you and anyone who's here with you to pose for a photo with um, the Board of Trustees. I now invite our trustees we're already here, so <laughs> good. We're ready to go. This quarter, we received 13 nominations into four award categories, certificated, classified, community, and group. And here are our difference makers. In the category of certificated staff member, this quarter's difference maker is Susan Abudra from Hughes Elementary. Susan, please come forward. Um, Susan embodied our core value of students first. We believe that preparing students to adapt and thrive in a rapidly changing global, globally connected world should inform every decision. We believe that incorporating student voice is essential to our success in understanding and meeting student needs. School principal Joe Young, says, the Catherine Hughes Elementary School community is honored to have Susan Abudra on our staff. Her work as our literacy intervention teacher for students in grades three through five truly exemplifies the core value of students first. Mrs. Abudra has been on the Hughes staff since the 2000-2001 school year, and through these two decades of work, she has made a positive impact on students, families, and staff. Students who meet with Mrs. Abudra and her leveled literacy intervention groups enjoy their learning experiences, gain valuable life skills, for example, perseverance and risk-taking, and they not only grow in their literacy skills, but also their study skills. Her work is always focused on students, meeting them where they are and taking them to the next level. She is receptive and supportive of student needs. When the Catherine Hughes Elementary School staff thinks of people who exemplify the core value of student first, Mrs. Abudra is definitely on top of the list. The selection committee commends Susan for her years of service. They noted that she has always taken the time to learn about the students and put them first by collaborating with her colleagues regarding goals for students and what they need to be successful. Congratulations, Susan Abudra. Mr. Scheel is going to be our photographer. If you Thank mm -hmm. you. 
in the category of classified staff member. This quarter's difference maker is Cecilia Altamirano from Bowers Elementary School. Cecilia embodies our core value of connected families and collaborative community. We believe that community action is essential to achieving our vision and having a positive impact on student outcomes, including their health and wellness. We serve as a catalyst for a call to action with our parents, families, and community. Through support, engagement, involvement, and collaboration, we leverage our multiple perspectives and collective genius, develop better solutions, and deepen our shared commitment to success. Principal Adriana Reyes says the Bowers team would like to recognize Cecilia um, Altamirano for her diligent work serving our community. Cecilia organized our family resource fair where families could explore community organizations and sign up for bus passes and meal applications. Cecilia has been integral in ensuring we connect with families and provide families with interpretation services during parent teacher conferences. In collaboration with our SEAL coach, Cecilia helped schedule all conferences that required interpretation services and conferences with siblings. She goes above and beyond her role as our LSAT. She connects with families and helps in any way she can. For example, she met with families before science camp to help complete required paperwork and to put their minds at ease about sending their children to sleep away camp. The Bowers community is lucky to have Cecilia at our school. The selection committee was impressed by the number of activities Cecilia is involved in. It is clear that she is determined to figure out what it takes to connect families to the school and to their children's learning and put their learning into action. Congratulations to Cecilia Altamirano. In the category of community member, this quarter's difference maker is Clara Maj from Washington Open Elementary School <laughs> for embodying our core value of integrity and ethical stewardship. We believe in upholding our fiscal responsibility through integrity and high ethical standards. We gain high levels of trust and foster collective responsibility across our organization through effective stewardship of our resources and consistent ethical, transparent, accountable behavior and actions. Principal Heidi Pulowski says, Clara is a parent in our community. She is the head of our gardening program and she has turned a small plot of land at our school into a wonderland. She works tirelessly to build a love of the earth with the students she works with, helping them to understand how to work with the land and how to take care of it. She is inclusive of all students and families at the school, inviting everyone to join in the fun. She works with teachers and classroom parent leads to design and implement programs where students are learning reading, writing, and math skills all through working with the land. The selection committee noted how important it is to teach the community and our children the importance of caring for our environment and ethical stewardship of our earth. It is critical to teach environmental awareness at an age when it becomes internalized for young st students and to help them grow a love of their experience. Congratulations. <laughs>
And our final award this evening in the category of group, team, or organization, this quarter's difference makers are the Huerta Middle School PTSA Board. Um, for embodying the core value of connected families and collaborative community. Come on up, Huerta. We believe that community action is essential to achieving our vision and having a positive impact on student outcomes, including their health and wellness. We serve as a catalyst for a call to action with our parents, families, and community. Through support, engagement, involvement, and collaboration, we leverage our multiple perspectives and collective genius, develop better solutions, and deepen our shared commitment to success. Principal Donnell Sontag says about Huerta, PTSA board, last year, a small but mighty group of dedicated parents worked to create a parent organization for Huerta. This shifted in the early spring to the PTSA, and now we have chartered organization with a growing membership. Our PTSA board members feel passionately about wanting to support our students, staff, and community, and finding ways to increase families' connectedness to school. They raise money and organize events such as family movie night, the community picnic, student dances, activity days, and more. They have so many ideas for how to strengthen our community, and it's been so exciting to see our home and school relationships deepen. The Huerta PTSA board is a wonderful model for how families and the school can partner. The selection committee says that it is critical that a brand new school focus on building community and culture, especially one that serves students and families from multiple cities and communities. It is a big lift to start from scratch, and this dedicated team deserves recognition for starting something brand new and creating it themselves. It's a big commitment. Congratulations, Huerta PTSA board. Thank you. Right. It's the holy cake. You're welcome to stay. <laughs> You're welcome to stay, but I understand if you if you don't. Well, thank you all for your wonderful work benefiting our students and our district. The next item on our agenda is item E.1, report from the superintendent. Thank you. And maybe I can have somebody close those doors if they want to keep chatting. I don't want to, I don't want to, no, they don't need to leave right away. I just, we need to continue the meeting or we'll be here all night. exciting site visit uh, to Briarwood and enjoyed touring with Principal Jessic. I had the opportunity to visit a number of classrooms that were each doing such uh, incredible work. And there was a great feel about the school as well. I had the chance to see some students working on their goal of running 100 miles this school year under the watchful morning eye of PE teacher Tracy Evans. Go Pandas! Last week, I visited Central Park to visit their student-created Ohlone Museum. The students were completing a multi-week project-based learning experience where they heard from an Ohlone docent, created realia in their makerspace, and utilized technology to create hands-on experiences for learning around animals, plants, and a host of other key things uh, that they had learned about the Ohlone. It was a wonderful example of equity-based learning that leaned in on creativity and student agency to create shared learning experiences. We, um, let's see, we had three run, hide, fight drills this week regarding school safety uh, at Santa Clara High School. 
Wilcox High School in Central Park. The Run, Hide, Fight curriculum is offered by our partners at SCPD, and they are training each of our faculties. These include a staff training and two drills that are coordinated with first responders and SCPD and other jurisdictions. Our thanks to our partners at Santa Clara Police Department for their partnership in this important effort. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of attending the Santa Clara County Office of Education's Power of Democracy event. It was timely on the heels of our November elections and stressing through this nonpartisan effort the importance of civic engagement of our students. It was a particular honor to be there to celebrate Pilar Svensson, teacher from Santa Clara High School, who was cited for her work with mock trial and supporting the state seal of civic engagement with the State Seal of Civic Engagement Outstanding Educator Award. Congratulations, Pilar. Our first uh, DLAC or District English Learner Advisory Committee meeting took place this year on October 19th and had a solid turnout. This is a critical team for our district that provides input and guidance on our ongoing work in support of students who are English learners. Uh, DLAC elections took place and the following DLAC officers for the year were elected. Uh, the data assessment department shared district spring LPAC and CASP student data with participants and answered questions. And participants brainstormed topics of interest that they are wanted uh, interested in hearing about during future DLAC meetings. On a related note, I had the high honor of providing the keynote at the PK graduation earlier this week. PK is Parent Institute for Quality Education, and it's offered at Santa Clara High School, and the graduation represented the completion of the parents' educational program as they learned about our educational system and how to support and advocate for their children and youth. Thanks to Vice Principal Nelson Horry for the support of his, this program and to the PK staff. It was an inspiring evening, and I want to commend the parents for dedicating the time and commitment to their children's well-being and success in school and life beyond. Delightful also was to hear the parent keynotes that were delivered by Pedro Aguas and Cuauhtémoc Amesqua Quesada. Congratulations to the 57 graduates of the program. We are meeting for our initial meeting next week with the Superintendent Student Council with represent, representation from each of our secondary schools. I'm excited to meet with our young leaders as we talk about the importance of leadership, how they can have a voice in our district and their communities, and guide them in electing their student senators who will meet in December to elect our student trustee. I also wanted to wrap up this evening with a shout out to Irene Lee from Don Callajohn, who won the 21st Annual International Essay Contest from the Unique, Gifted, Lovable You organization with her inspiring story entitled, Remember Your People and Say Warm Words. Irene's essay is not only profound, but it contains insights into the journey of overcoming bullying, says Betty Hoffner, co-founder and CEO of the National Nonprofit. Here is a portion of her powerful poem. If you get bullied, you feel worthless, like no one respects you or no one is there for you. When you feel so lonely, even empty, you may hate the world. It's hard to respect yourself. After being bullied, the trauma might remain. Looking back, whenever I was stuck with bullies, I tried to remember that there is someone who takes care of me. I remember that I have my family. I have a dad who always says I'm the most beautiful in the world and a mom who freaks out when I get a little hurt. She knows about me from the start to the end, and I have grandparents in Korea who are always proud of me. This contest is part of a program offered to schools and youth serving organizations to empower them to be part of the solution to bullying, substance abuse, racism, and suicide. The contest was judged by an independent panel of professional journalists and writers. Congratulations to Irene and her eloquent and important perspectives about anti-bullying. That concludes my remarks this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Waddell. Next up is our reports from union presidents. We will start with CSCA. Good evening, Dr. Waddell, President Muirhead. Saying that for the last time. Huh? Yeah, it's on. You not hear me? Turn it back on. Oh, maybe it wasn't. 
Okay. Um, start again. Good evening, Dr. Waddell, President Muirhead, for the last time, and trustees. I'd like to start my report this evening uh, by sharing with you some of the things Chapter 350 is currently doing as part of our continued commitment to supporting our schools and our community. One way we're doing this is with our involvement with the FRC Holiday Giving Tree being held November 21st through December 9th. There are three ways we, as a chapter, and you, all of you, can um, support this is by either donating toys or new toys or gift cards, direct cash donations, or even adopting an entire family and helping fulfill their wishes and needs this holiday season. We're also helping to raise funds for our schools by having created a chapter 350 team that will participate, because I don't run, in the annual firehouse run. In my case, it's probably gonna be the crawl. Uh, we are ratcheting up the fun factor this year by challenging our UTSC colleagues to a friendly competition in five areas. The individual fastest time, the most participants, the most spirited group, we may need to call on one or two of you to be impartial judges for that because I'm sure we're gonna be the most spirited. Um, the, collective group, the collective group fastest time and most importantly, the most money raised. So we look forward to winning bragging rights, but most importantly to raising money for the Santa Clara Schools Foundation. And I just have to say to Margie that I have now officially thrown down the gauntlet. We held our first hybrid chapter meeting this past Tuesday. It went fairly well and we only had a few minor glitches. We had members attend in person, which was nice. It was the first time we've done that. And we, um, since COVID, and we had members who were participating via Zoom. It was fun, a little nerve wracking, and well, for me at least, an excellent learning opportunity. Although I know all of you are old hands at this, my hope is that they will improve with time. We are continuing to deepen our partnership with UTSC and district management. ACB Consulting will be here next week to guide our district learning team in the goal of supporting and helping our schools in the development of building effective teams that collaborate and use data to improve student outcomes. This is important work and our chapter is actively identifying ways to help have highly qualified classified employees as members of these site teams. Lastly, thank you, uh, President Muirhead for your outstanding term as board president. You guided us through some very challenging time and you did it with grace and dignity. Thank you. And this concludes my report, except for I must say have a wonderful three-day weekend. My husband's birthday happens to fall on Veterans Day. So enjoy tomorrow's day off that is in his honor, at least in his head. Thank you very much, Lynn, for the nice comments. Now we have UTSC. <laughs> to our uh, CSEA colleagues, we say challenge accepted. Good evening, President Muirhead, Dr. Waddell, and Board of Trustees. I'd like to start my presentation with a shout out from Montague Elementary School. We have a bit, we have a picture to share. We show that picture. Thank you. Um, the picture on the screen, which is coming up on the screen, um, was. Uh, sent to us from two second grade teachers, Mrs. Hopper and Mrs. Bush of Montague. This picture was sent uh, to us on October 31st, which re feels like a really, really long time ago, but in reality was just last Monday. Uh, Mrs. Hopper wrote, the second grader is at Montague from Mrs. Ho from Mrs. Hopper and Mrs. Bush's classes, created a growth mindset rock garden for the school. We painted rocks and wrote growth mindset quotes on them. We all want we want all students to know that they are amazing and can do all things. Sweet little picture. Although it makes me think a little bit of Easter. Mm. This week, I've attended two advisory uh, meetings regarding professional learning with our elementary folks and our middle school folks. I want to thank our teachers and TOSAs who attended these meetings. You know who you are, along with one of our administrators from our secondary, one of our secondary sites. 
In these robust meetings, the groups reflected back on the PD that was held on October 21st, as well as looking forward to our PD scheduled for January and March. Our teachers look forward to partnering with the district, not only to increase teacher attendance, but to make the PD engaging and relevant to the needs of our teachers. We look forward to sharing feedback and next steps from, with, from the professional learning advisory groups. As I was sitting in these meetings, however, it became crystal clear our teachers are feeling overwhelmed with the number of initiatives and requirements on their plates. Since COVID, teachers required weekly meetings have nearly doubled. We need to stop the practice of adding more to our teachers' plates without authentically removing an item. We should employ the practice of one on, one off. As we move into our thankful season, I'd like to share a quote that resonates with me. This is a quote from author Roy T. Bennett. Great things happen to those who don't stop believing, trying, learning, and being grateful. And like our CSCA president, Jody, we're also very grateful for your leadership. Thank you. This concludes the UTSC report for tonight's school board meeting. Have a wonderful three-day weekend and a great Thanksgiving. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure working with both of you these past two years. And I'll still be on the board. Don't everyone like think I'm going away. I'm just not going to be board present. Okay, next we have our public health update, including COVID-19. So Dr. Waddell, would you like to introduce this? Yes, thank you. We have uh, some updates that uh, Chief Shield will deliver this evening. We've um, we've had a superintendents and public health COVID uh, update meeting this this week, and I've heard some news. We're tracking, as you'll hear, both COVID uh, rise in RSV and the flu all at the same time. So we're trying to urge a little bit of more caution. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Shield. Thank you. Uh, as we move into the winter months, uh, cases of, as, as stated, cases of COVID, flu, and RSV are all on the rise throughout the county. Uh, the Santa Clara County Public Health Department advises that the most important mitigation measures are wearing a high-quality mask while indoors, practicing frequent hand washing and hand sanitizing, vaccination for flu and COVID, um, and also staying home and contacting a healthcare provider when sick. I should also point out that there is no R uh, vaccine for RSV. The Santa Clara County Public Health Department has launched an updated wastewater dashboard for COVID-19. With the prevalence of at-home testing, wastewater data is more accurate picture of the current status of COVID uh, in the community. Uh, our district team regularly monitors the county public health, health dashboards in order to ensure that we are uh, making appropriate adjustments. As a reminder, uh, the district will continue to offer free rapid antigen test kits for staff and students. I've mentioned this at the prior three board meetings. Uh, so far, we have already uh, sent communication to the school sites for the November distribution. I was at a couple of our sites already and saw the pallets of tests that are sitting there. Uh, Santa Clara High had them sitting right by the front door. Um, it was a little bit of a tripping hazard, but they'll get those taken care of and, and moved out of the way. Uh, information has gone out to our management team, including communication templates for informing staff, family, and students about test distribution and uh, positive test reporting. Uh, as a general framework, I will say what we are doing for this break is similar to what we did uh, through the prior uh, Thanksgiving and winter breaks uh, from last year. We continue to remind the public that a bivalent booster is available for children ages five and up. These boosters replace the original booster and include vaccines for both the original strain and the Omicron variant. Children are encouraged to receive this booster if it has been more than two months since their last COVID vaccination or booster. These, available, these boosters are available through health insurance, pharmacies, and county clinics, and most care providers offer a free flu vaccine at the same time. And I haven't had to do this yet, so we have an MPX update formerly known as monkeypox. Recently, the California Department of Public Health published guidelines regarding MPX in the child care and school settings. Generally speaking, this is the guidance. If a person with MPX symptoms was at a child care or school facility, we have been advised to contact the Santa Clara County Public Health Department and seek further assistance. Someone exposed 
or had contact with someone with MPX, no quarantines are needed. So if an individual has been exposed or contact, no quarantine is, is needed. If an individual is positive for MPX, the individual must isolate. Additional guidance can be found at sccphd.org slash MPX. And this concludes our report for this evening. Thank you, Mr. Shield. I would just add that um, public health has said in the in the um, monitoring of, of MPX, there's been no uh, no cases in our county with uh, children um, having symptoms, and that it requires prolonged physical contact to uh, to transmit. So even um, contact sports and those sorts of things don't have to engage in any additional protocols at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? No. Okay, thank you. Next up is um, public comment on unagendized items. So this is a chance to speak on something that is not on the agenda, but is related to uh, our school district or education. So uh, is there anyone in the room who wish to speak on unagendized comments? Okay, seeing none. If you are on the live stream, you have to join the um, webinar in order to make public comment. If you're on the webinar and you want to speak on unagendized items, now would be the time to raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, we will move on. The next item is public comment on agendized items. So if you want to speak on something that's on the agenda and you don't want to wait until that item comes, now would be the time to speak. Now, is there anyone in the room who wishes to speak? On an agendized item. Okay, is there anyone on the webinar who wishes to speak? Now's the time to raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, we will move on. Next up is our consent items. So can I have a motion, motion to, to approve, approve consent, Otterman? Items I.2 through I.21. And uh, we have a motion from Trustee Ratterman and a second from Trustee Gonzalez. And we're doing all roll call votes because we have a trustee on the Zoom. So Trustee Canova. You have to use your mic or the audience can't hear you. On the Zoom. On the Zoom, yeah, the Zoom can't hear yes. you. Okay, thank you. Trustee Fairchild. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez. Yes. Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Ratterman. Yes. And uh, Trustee Ryan is absent and I say yes. So that passes six to zero. All righty. Uh, next up is J.1, the second reading and approval for BP 6146.1, high school graduation requirements. Motion to approve, Rotterman. Second, Gonzalez. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Rotterman and a second from Trustee Gonzalez. We saw this last time. This is now a nice cleaned up version of it. Okay, any comments or questions? Any comments from the public in the room or on Zoom? Now it's time to raise your hand. Okay, then um, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, sorry, motion from Trustee Ratterman, second from Trustee Gonzalez. We'll roll call vote, Trustee Canova. Yes. Trustee Fairchild. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez. Yes. Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Ratterman. Yes. Um, Trustee Ryan is absent. And um, I also say yes, so that passes six to zero. Okay, next one is K.1. Resolution number 22-48, resolution of the governing board of the Santa Clara Unified School District amending the conflict of interest code pursuant to the Political Reform Act of 1974. Before you uh, make a motion, just wanna say that we've got this on here because we, the, the astute observer might've recalled that we passed this last month or last meeting, but it had an incorrect resolution number. So we had to re-approve it. I'm getting the nodding head from uh, Mr. Scheel. We motion were re-approving it. to approve it. the correct number. Second, okay, so we have a motion from uh, Trustee Raderman, second from Trustee Gonzalez. Any concerns about the new number? No, it's in order. That's a good thing. Okay, then we'll do a roll call vote. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Fairchild? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Raderman? Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent, and I say yes. So that passes six to zero. 
Next one is L.1, ratification of the appointment of the Administrative Secretary for Human Resources. We have an announcement. Uh, move to approve. Second, Roderman. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Gonzalez, Dr. Gonzalez. Thank you. Good evening, board members, Dr. Waddell and Ms. Mystery. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Cecilia Chico Carrillo. Uh, Cecilia received her bachelor's from uh, CSU Stanislaus in Business Administration and her MBA from San Jose State University. Cecilia was hired in Santa Clara Unified School District in March of 2016 as the district receptionist. Soon after, uh, she was selected as a personal assistant too. In that position, she handled the Keenan trainings for all employees, assisted in, with setting up interviews, uh, fingerprinting new hi hirees and volunteers, also um, uh, setting up interactive meetings and maintaining records. Uh, Cecilia has been very active in CSA as well. She was the chapter 350 treasurer from November 2017 to December 2021. And in January of 2022, she became the chapter uh, 350 secretary. So um, congratulations. She is. Not Welcome. anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> 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 no. Let it be known that she will no longer be on the CSEA executive board. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Any questions or comments? Congratulations. Any, any comments from the room or online? <laughs> Applause all around. I'm just so the people at home know. Okay, then we have a motion from Trustee Fairchild, a second from Trustee Ratterman to approve this appointment. Uh, uh, Trustee Canova? Yes. 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 There yes. Thank you. yes. There's, there, there's something about educating students and you know how you have to keep reminding them. And, yeah, thank you. Okay, Trustee Fairchild? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent and I say yes. So that passes six to zero. Congratulations. Next item is M.1, resolution number 22-49, authorizing a final change order to the contract with Miss Mastria Inc. for additional work on the Dolores Huerta Middle School Can project. Can I request that we do both M1 and M2 together? Um, their resolutions, I, they need to be separate. Is that what you're saying? They need to be separate. Okay. okay. Okay, I'm sorry, who, who made the first? I made the first, I guess. Okay, and the second from, so the first from Trustee Raderman, the second from Trustee Gonzalez. Any questions or comments about this item? Oops, I'm putting it on the wrong one. Now you made me switch. Okay, then um, with a motion from Trustee Raderman, a second from, oh, any comments or questions in the room? Any uh, public comments on Zoom? Okay, seeing none, then um, we'll do a roll call vote. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Fairchild? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent. And I say yes, so that passes six to zero. Uh, the next one is M.2, resolution number 22-50, authorizing a final change order to the contract with Terra Light Inc. for additional work on the Kathleen McDonald High School project. Second, Ratterman. Okay, we have um, a motion from Trustee Gonzalez and a second from Trustee Raderman. Any comments or questions? Or anyone in the room or online who has a comment or question, public comment? Okay, then we'll go ahead and vote. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Fairchild? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Raderman? Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent and I say yes, so that passes six to zero. So can we handle the next two items together then? N1 and 2. Um, I don't see any reason why not. Any reason why not? Second, Gonzalez. Is there any reason why? Okay. So we've got... Um, Motion by Rotterman. Okay. Second by Gonzalez. Uh, okay. And um, we're doing both items N.1 and N.2 together. Uh, we have a motion from Trustee Rotterman, a second from Trustee Gonzalez. Is there any comments in the room? Any um, comments on Zoom, the webinar? 
Okay, then we'll go ahead and vote. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Fairchild? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Aye. Uh, Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent. And I say yes, so that passes six to zero. Okay, then we can move on to O, the uh, O.1 Williams, Williams Valenzuela quarterly report. Uh, Dr. Waddell, is there anything to report there? There's nothing to report. This year. Okay, nice empty report. Great, thank you. Um, uh, is there any comments on the empty report? Nope, okay. O.2 is presentation on the phase one and draft, fi draft final Briarwood, Bracker, and Westwood Elementary School Master Plans. Hey, and we got to you before 11 o'clock at night. Aren't you excited? <laughs> well, we'd like to uh, recognize uh, Chief Shield to introduce his Cracker Jack team uh, on to present this uh, update on phase one and draft final school master plans for the three sites. So good evening. This is an exciting time. Um, as you know, we've spent several months working on um, the Bracker, Briarwood, and Westwood master plans, and then also um, coming up with a list of draft phase one plans as well. So this is an update to prior presentations received. Um, it is anticipated that this will be brought back to the board for approval at the December board meeting. Presentation this evening will be by Michelle Healy and also Maria Madrigal from our architect firm LPA. And then also here this evening is Larry Adams and Rochella Defenser, just in case there is some additional questions um, or they can provide moral support and cheering from the background. Um, but they're here also. So, and uh, then we'll uh, be able to answer some questions after the very brief, very, very, very brief presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, we will be presenting a little bit different uh, presentations than what we've given you before. The base information is the same, but uh, some of what we originally planned in phase 1A has changed. And so what I want to review tonight with you is what we've done and we've received input from the community. We've had more community meetings. We've gone to the district staff and we've also received input from the board. What's new this time is that we now have done some cost estimates and that is coming from LPA architects. And we have seen an increase in construction costs of over 20% in the last 12 months. And so that has really changed some of the plans and master plans that we presented last time we were here. And so we are saying that these cost estimates included in this presentation are very rough. They are cost estimates that are um, going to be changing as time goes on, because in two years, when we bid out the phase 1A projects, we just don't know what those construction costs are going to be. And so after the summer work in 2023, we'll have a better idea of some of the construction costs and some of these start off quick start projects that we'll be introducing. But we really want to say that these are very rough estimates because we just no one can predict where the construction costs are going to be in two years when these go to bid. We are looking at alternative funding sources. So whether that could be developer fees, Fund 40, um, potentially getting some reimbursements from the state uh, if they ever pass another general obligation bond for uh, statewide construction. Um, and those would be reimbursements for applications that we've already sent. So we are definitely looking at different funding sources to try and ease some of the um, costs that would be coming from the Measure BB bond. So at the end of this presentation, I won't be presenting them, but we included an appendix and those appendixes, appendices show the different projects that we pulled out of phase 1A that were originally supposed to be and we had hoped we could include in these Measure BB projects, but that because of the cost estimates and the updates, we have now moved to further down to unfunded status. This is just a brief 
overview of our stakeholder engagement. And I will say that we, um, the one thing that's different on here than what you've seen before is that we did hold community meetings at Briarwood, Bracker, and Westwood in October. And with that, Maria is going to go through each of the schools and the priorities, as well as the summer projects and the phase 1A projects. Thanks, Michelle. So we'll start off with uh, Bracker Elementary School. So when we did the community engagement, we surveyed uh, both the staff and the community to understand what the priority projects would be in the master plan. So for Bracker Elementary School, the priority number one was the larger multi-purpose room with a proper cooking kitchen. Um, but we also you know, ranked um, some other priorities um, that they did um, convey to us, improve parking lot and circulation to ease the traffic on chromite, moving the children's center out of the portables at the south west end of the site, and then a larger administration area as well as wellness spaces. Uh, some additional feedback we got was regarding the location of extended day, outdoor learning spaces and gardens, and providing specialty classrooms. So what you see on the screen now is the potential uh, phase one that Michelle was uh, talking about earlier. So we've split it into uh, two separate phases. So the summer work, which is outlined in blue, and it'll be the same for all three schools, um, the blue color, um, and then an outline in yellow, which would be the phase one plan. So the intent is to try to get all of that work done uh, this summer. So we're working with the bond program to um, schedule that and make sure the schedule works. So that includes new play structures for uh, lower grade, upper grade, as well as kindergarten as well as a shade structure and a hardcore rehabilitation. And that's an estimate of 2.6 million. Phase 1A includes uh, a transitional kindergarten and preschool building with a play yard and a shade structure, which you can see in the top uh, corner there, uh, a multi-purpose building with a cooking kitchen, uh, restrooms, and a shade structure as well. It also includes addressing the parking lot at the front of the school, um, and I do want to mention that all this construction is currently occurring um, where the existing fields are, so that won't affect um, any of the existing multipurpose spaces. Um, that phase 1A is $30.5 million for an estimate of about $33 million for the summer and the phase 1A work. So now the final master plan um, it's similar to what we presented in the past, so I'll just uh, give you some quick facts about it. So we are planning Bracker for 600 students. Um, it includes, obviously, the phase one work, the preschool area, the parking lot, the NPR. Uh, the difference in the NPR here is that we did move the PE classroom to the phase 1B, the unfunded category. It includes the entry plaza reconfigured existing buildings to accommodate two additional kindergarten classrooms as well as an SAI kindergarten classroom and an expanded kindergarten area. It also includes a new two-story classroom building at the south end of the site um, in addition to uh, two extended day classrooms that are adjacent to that parking lot. Um, and lastly, it does include modernization of all of the existing finger wings and some reconfiguration, for example, where the library moves to the new building, those, that space is reconfigured for classrooms. Um, and then there's also just the field and the hard courts once everything's in place. Before you move on, um, you said something I just wanted to clarify. Did you say 600 students? That's like twice of what it's currently has. So I just, there's, yes, that's correct. Yeah, okay. The plan is 600. Yeah, so all of the new construction north of Kiefer, uh, north of Costco, basically, that whole development, the Lawrence Station area plan, all those elementary students will go to Bracker. Okay, thank you. All right, um, and then uh, we're still working on the potential phasing of how this uh, unfunded work will occur. Um, what you see at the top there, the phase 1B and C, those are some of the highest priority projects that we were not able to include in that phase 1A. So we put that at the top of the list. Um, and then um, going down, the, the next phase would be the kindergarten um, reconfiguration. The, sec the third uh, phase would be the two-story classroom building, housing fourth, fifth grade, 
SAI classroom, STEM, library, and that parking lot. Uh, followed by the modernization of the grades uh, first through third in the existing finger wings, followed by hard courts and the extended day building. So the overall cost of this unfunded uh, need is 61.6 .6 million. Maria, before you go on. Yes. Um, so as Michelle stated earlier, we know that our cost estimates are high because of what we're seeing in our current. But as she also said, one of the things that we're looking at is how could we potentially fund these in a different way? And so what we know with Bracker, because of the residential development that's happening or projected to happen in the area, one potential funding source that would allow us to potentially solve this is through developer fees that we have collected over the years. And so this is an example of how we would be looking at another alternative funding source to potentially pay for some of these projects outside of Measure BB not only because it's an allowable funding use for developer fees, but also in order to address what we're seeing in these inflationary costs. So I, I wanted to use this as an example to kind of uh, piggyback off of what Michelle said earlier. And since Bracker fits that de description, that's why I wanted to put that front right there and in there. Okay. Um, Trustee Fairchild has a clarifying question. Um, my clarifying question is, how did you come up with the um, ranking or the order of priority? Yeah, it's not necessarily a ranking. It's just an order of how the construction would be phased. Um, for example, if there's no um, interim housing, you would want to build a two-story classroom building so that you still have the classrooms and then remodel those classrooms once you have the additional uh, classroom space. But we're still working on the phasing. This is just kind of our first pass. Okay. Um, we'll be refining it and presenting the final proposal in December. Thank you. All right, please continue. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these projects, like the fields and hard courts, we could do that at any time. So that doesn't necessarily fall into it has to be done after we modernize, after we do all these other things. So a portion, what we're looking at with all these master plans as we move through each of our schools is that we will have projects that can move up or down the list depending on the school's need, available funding, and all of that. So just because we put numbers to them here doesn't mean that that's the order that they need to go in. And that'll be the same for all three of the schools. That, that applies even to the one that said phase 1B and 1C? Or is that meant to be the first things you do and then everything else is unordered? We just identified those as the next priorities based on the feedback that we got from staff in the community, but it could change. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And yeah, so now uh, we'll pause for questions uh, on Bracker and then we'll move on to Briarwood. Uh, Trustee Gonzalez, go ahead. So I know it's noted that uh, we don't know where costs are going to be when we start building, doing some of these items. Um, most likely they won't decrease, correct? They'll probably be higher. Um, I guess the, the question I have would be, uh, we, if we were to get, um, I, I know we have the input and priorities that, that we kind of have set up from the community and staff, um, just, uh, Making sure if this is kind of the the um, the phases that we would take, you know, phase one B, one C would be next, and then two, three, um, that we uh, that would help us as far as for the supporter staff to look at, you know, okay, maybe for for phase two at the different locations, you know, we would have some cost estimate for that. So I, I think that would be important. Just just if we have to tweak anything. As far as the phases that we work on, kind of getting those up, uh, and maybe even with with Larry's assistance to make sure that we, hey, you know, hey, if we did phase two, that's going to be like really impactful to the site. You know, it would have to be done during the summer or something. So just just understanding when uh, these phases would be best implemented, and also understanding the cost would be important for us in future decisions that we make. So I will mention that um, the phase 1A projects have been escalated to, um, so those cost estimates do include bidding out in 2024, 2025. 
so those cost estimates have been escalated. The rest of the cost estimates are in today's dollars, just because it's so, we just don't know at this point. We hope that after COVID, manufacturing starts coming back. Some of these costs may decrease a little bit once the supply chain starts to resupply everything like it was pre-COVID. But right now, it's just too unstable to be able to estimate those. So summer work is um, $2022. Phase 1A is $24. Yes. Um, I, had, uh, I just wanted to make sure I understood this correctly. Phase 1A says um, transitional kindergarten and preschool building, but it, it looks like a couple of buildings in that corner. It, is, is that really, is it one building? You're, you're, you're going to do all of, all of that top right, correct? Correct. And is it, is it all one building? It, not necessarily. The master plans are just diagrammatic showing the program. Once we get into design, we'll determine, you know, if it's one building, two buildings. Got it. Okay. That's fine. Any other questions? Okay. Then let's um, move on to Briarwood. All right, so Briarwood, the number one priority that we heard was uh, moving the Children's Center out of the portables at the north end of the site, um, providing modernized spaces for preschool, transitional kindergarten, and kindergarten. Um, and then we also had a couple of other priorities, um, addressing the parking lot and drop-off circulation at the front of the school, um, having a permanent stage and a better functioning kitchen in the multi-purpose space, and modernizing restrooms. And then some additional feedback, um, planning for just separate areas for preschool and kindergarten, providing shade at hard courts, uh, addressing safety and access of the school, and making the front of the campus uh, function better. Um, in addition, similar to Bracker, providing the specialty classrooms like STEM. So for Briarwood, again, splitting up that phase one into summer work and the phase 1A. So the summer work includes uh, transitional kindergarten and kindergarten play yard um, and shade structure. So making sure those play structures are appropriate uh, for the younger kiddos, uh, lower and upper grade play structures, a shade structure in the hard courts, as well as hard court rehabilitation. And that would total to $3 million. Phase 1A includes modernization of existing classrooms to make uh, those classrooms larger to accommodate uh, transitional kindergarten um, and kindergarten classrooms as well, as well as a kindergarten play yard at the south end of the site there. Um, in addition, addressing the parking lot, um, utilizing some of the underutilized space at the front of the school at Briarwood. Yes, so a clarifying question from Trustee Fairchild. Sure. Should fencing be on your summer work list? Fencing is already bid, um, so that will be coming sooner than the summer. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. We're already doing that. It... Okay. Great. We just awarded the contracts. I'm just for the audience. Because we were still talking about the fence design right at the last meeting. All right, and then the master plan. So this site is planned for 300 students. Um, the phase one, like I talked about, it mostly encompasses that south end of the site with the kindergarten, the early childhood area. Um, it also includes um, a new administration building, an addition to the NPR with a larger kitchen and some support spaces as well. It includes uh, reconfiguring some existing space for a wellness center, modernizing the library, as well as modernizing all of the existing finger wings. Um, in addition, at the north end of the site, uh, south of the baseball fields, uh, there is a one-story classroom building uh, that contains PE, STEM, and also extended day classrooms. There's also reconfiguration uh, of the field and then uh, reconfiguration of the hard courts. Uh, so again, the phase 1B was pulled out of the initial uh, proposed phase 1, and that includes the multi-purpose uh, modernization, the kitchen addition, and then modernization of the existing what is now kindergarten building that could potentially become 
uh, preschool and then an early childhood garden. Um, the subsequent uh, phases, phase two would be library modernization and reconfiguration of the existing space for the wellness center, then the new administration building, modernization of classrooms, grade one through five and the faculty lounge, and then the uh, new building for the extended day PE STEM classrooms, and then the fields and hard courts. So this need, the future need for Briarwood would be 38.4 million. And then we'll pause again for questions or comments. Any questions or comments? Yeah. All right, so uh, last but not least, Westwood. So the number one priority we heard loud and clear from staff was to move the existing portables um, away from the hard courts where it was bisecting the play areas and it was hard to supervise. Um, following that, we also heard um, the need for a larger multi-purpose room with a larger cooking kitchen that's centrally located on the campus, addressing the parking lot drop-off and circulation to ease the traffic that backs up on Saratoga and the adjacent neighborhoods, um, a centrally located administration area, and then an early childhood cluster. Some additional feedback we heard was about the lack of shade and the uh, the desire to keep all the existing trees on campus, the location of extended day, again, the backup of traffic on Saratoga, and then providing indoor and outdoor learning spaces. So phase one for the summer work, the proposal is to remove those portables that are centrally located on the campus and move them to the north end of the field. Um, it also includes lower, upper grade, and kindergarten play, structure, play structures, uh, a shade structure, and the hard court rehabilitation. For phase 1A, it includes a reconfigured campus entry of the western, I would say, um, parking lot. So we are able to um, move the driveway leading to the drop-off further up on Saratoga to ease some of the issues with traffic uh, on the adjacent neighborhood and also extend that parking lot so that we have more drop-off lane uh, to ease that traffic situation. Um, it also includes a multi-purpose building uh, with a new kitchen and a lunch shelter. Um, and the phase 1A is, actually there's a typo on there, it should be 17.2 million. Summer work is 5.4 million, which adds up to the 22.6 million that you see at the top of the screen. And then moving on to the master plan. So Westwood is planned for 400 students. Uh, the phase one includes the parking lot that we spoke about, the NPR building, um, and then the rest of the phases would include a new two-story classroom building at the middle north end of the site there uh, with an outdoor quad, a new administration area that fronts the front of the campus on Saratoga, um, reconfiguring the library, modernizing an existing finger wing for first grade, and then providing a new construction for the preschool, TK, and kindergarten, as well as new play areas. Uh, it also includes reconfiguring the existing parking lot um, that's currently where the drop-off occurs, and then a wellness and PE um, and OT building. Uh, similarly, uh, the hard courts uh, would get redone, and the field uh, would also get redone and reconfigured. So for Westwood, in terms of the phase 1B that was left from phase 1 plan, uh, it's the administration building, uh, and the staff and preschool parking lot, as well as the amphitheater um, outside of the NPR. The subsequent phases include the new preschool, uh, the library and first grade uh, building modernization, the two-story classroom building that would house second through first grade through fifth grade classrooms, extended day and STEM, and uh, a new building for PE and wellness following that, and then field hard courts and making that grove of trees at the north end of the site, the nature walk, um, a little bit more usable to students. So the overall um, future need for this site would be 67.6 .6 million.
Okay. Uh, Trustee Ratman. Yes. Um, so I've gotten some feedback from the neighborhood, and I know that you're familiar, at least I know that our staff is familiar with this because I've had quite a few conversations about it. Um, one of the issues result, revolves around the fencing that would be in the north end of the property. And I believe that that has been addressed. Uh, there were some concerns about fire safety with things getting trapped between fences. Maybe you could elaborate on that. And then there's been some concerns over the trees that are there, but I think that's beyond the scope of what you're, you're trying to work on. But I do wanna maybe just make sure that we investigate whether or not the trees that are there are healthy. I don't know if we have an arborist that goes out. Also, I'd like to make sure there was some allegations that maybe they weren't meeting some of the electrical codes for overhead electrical lines. I don't, not familiar with any electrical lines there, but that doesn't mean that there isn't an issue. But I think those last two items are something that would be at a future meeting or maybe we could do some outreach to the community. But the, the fencing certainly is something. Michelle, would you be kind enough to comment? Sure. So the fencing along that northeastern portion, um, the residents were concerned that our new <laughs> property line fence was going to be very close to their existing wood fences and that the redwood duff coming off of the redwood trees would get trapped in between those two fences. And so working with our grounds department, we have decided to move that fence five feet away from the existing residential neighbors fences. And then there'll be gates for our grounds department to get in to be able to clean up the um, redwood branches are basically called duff. And so <laughs> the, um, the grounds department will be able to get in and clean that area out so that there won't be any fire hazards um, I have spoken to the Santa Clara Fire Department about that, and they are happy with the solution of moving that fence five feet away. And uh, we have had a recent arborist go out, and they we have arborists go out all the time and look at our school sites, and all of those trees have been deemed healthy, and they're also on a regular schedule to be trimmed. Very good. Thank you. So I think the most important piece of that is that we have consulted with the local fire department who has probably shouldn't use this word, blessed the uh, project and uh, the rest of it is under control. And I believe that uh, Mr. Shield will be looking at the electrical issues that were suggested uh, and again, beyond the scope of this. But thank you very much. I really, I, that all happened behind the scenes and I really appreciate the, the, how, how you guys jumped on top of that and took, 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 it, uh, took it to task. Thank you. Okay, you have questions? I have questions. You wanna go first? Okay, Trustee Fairchild. Uh, thank you so much. Um, these are uh, questions that have were brought up to the board in an email, and you may have seen this. And um, the point I, I I hadn't noticed this, but this school probably has. It's almost like every building will be gone. Is that true? Yeah, this school uh, really has some challenges because it's not laid out perpendicular to the road. It's laid out so that it has great sun angles. Um, and the needs of the school were such that it seemed like to get them to a position where they felt comfortable with needs that they had with the new STEM and with a learning outdoor learning areas. And they their number one project was putting that multi-purpose in the center of the campus. And they felt very, very strongly about that. And so in order to do that and then to make it a more cohesive school in the future, we felt that demolishing in the future, demolishing those buildings and rebuilding, especially in the north, that two-story classroom building is would be most beneficial for the school. So I I just want to throw something out there because I hadn't picked up on that. And I'm just kind of still processing that this is really just a whole new school design. And while I realize there are priorities, um, I, I kind of like to say something my my dad would have said is okay you want a, a new multi-purpose room building now if we put it in the center of the campus it's going to cause all of this to have to happen 
and this much money to have to be spent. However, we put it here, we can reduce that. And, and so I'm a little concerned um, that we're making location decisions. And that's a that's a huge financial decision um, based on a preference of location. And so I, for me, I would like to hear that this location, not as that's preferred, but like it's the best. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? That to me does is not a good enough reason to have to then tear down the entire school. So I will say that we looked at putting the multipurpose in several locations and really where it is now is it's too small. And so we couldn't put it back there. So no, no matter where we put it on the campus, we would be demolishing some classroom buildings um, unless we put it in the parking lot to the south, but then there's not really another good location to put the rest of the parking that's needed for this site. So um, the we did work and we are only demolishing that one classroom wing to put in the new multipurpose. And then these will be future, um, the two-story classroom building will be future. And that is something that down the road, we can say, yes, we wanna do that. Or maybe we just end up modernizing those classrooms. But for us and for the, where how the site wanted they want extended day near the parking lot we they really want new preschool tk classrooms that front a parking lot and have their own separate way and so in order to get all of that to fit it ended up being that and this is a this is a more of a 30-year plan so I, I hear what you're saying. I guess my concern is the multi-purpose room is in phase 1A yes. and it's committing us to a 30-year plan that the board has not approved. So we have not started the design of the multi and we will be bringing back the master plan in December for approval. Okay, um, that's all I have for now. Okay, I um, I have two things. Um, one is uh, we did a lot of work at our other schools uh, over the last couple of years, our elementary schools around um, shade structures and um, playgrounds. And I just uh, wanted to see, can you reset that? See that these three schools are getting the same uh, level of treatment on those items as our other schools that we've already done? So this summer they will be getting new playgrounds and um, that that's happening. We're in design. The, the bond office is meeting with the schools. They're picking playground um, equipment and the plan is to bring those playgrounds back to you for approval at the December board meeting so that then we can install them over the summer. And then our plan is to also install shade structures similar to um, what the other schools have. Some of them, so I guess these three schools are a little different because one of the major things that they all really wanted was more shade. And so the phase one projects also include a large shade structure that can is on the hard courts so that they can do PE under. So they'll actually, at the end, Briar or Bracker and Westwood will have two large shade structures, one for the lunch shelter um, and then one for PE. And then Briarwood will just have the one large shade structure for PE. Okay. So good. yes, they will be getting the same, if not a little bit more than what the other schools got. Okay, good. Then my other question is, um, and this might be something for Larry because it goes back in the history to when we passed this bond. But I thought uh, my recollection from being in all those meetings was that the schools had very old portables and we wanted to get rid of the portables. And um, two of these three, you're not, or maybe all three, you're not touching the portables for a long time. And um, I, I'm not sure what the bond language was, you know, is, is did we make any sort of commitment about those portables or about details about just what we needed to do in the bond language? Is it pretty flexible? And I'm just concerned about the age 
of the portables and how much life they have in them because I I thought the whole idea of reconfiguring the school, these three schools was because of their old portables. And I will say that it's their old portables where the preschool is and their children's centers are. And so, especially in Briarwood and Bracker, where those are the first projects that are moving forward. Um, Bracker will get new preschool, TK, a whole complex of those, and that will replace the children's center. And Westwood will also get, um, sorry, Briarwood gets modernization of existing classrooms to make them into the new TK. So then we can demolish or repurpose those old portables. Ah, okay. So two of the three are going to get rid of the portables as part of phase 1A. Yeah. And Westwood, their number one project is re relocating the portables that are in the middle of their campus. Mm -hmm. So we will be moving them. Um, and when the bond language was written, those portables were filled with our special education preschool. And now that we are starting to move those programs to other school sites, and it's not just clustered at Westwood, we then have moving those, we have the ability to relocate other programs that are in old portables at Westwood. We could potentially move those into the portables that we're moving, and then we can get rid of some of the older portables. So these are newer portables that you're moving? They are newer than the old portables yeah, okay. on the campus, yeah. Okay. And um, and you said phase 1A is in two years is, is the idea. So this summer of 23 will be um, the summer work and then 24-ish would be, um, so the, the new buildings might open fall of 25. Is that the this idea? Construction would start in 25. Construction would start in 25. So they would open? 26, 27 depending on the construction timeline. So it'll take about 18 months uh, to two years to design the permanent buildings. And then it'll be about an 18 months to two year construction timeline. Wow. Okay. Um, other questions? Trustee Radman, then Trustee Fairchild. Yeah, I was, I'm looking at some of the quotes and these are probably very accurate, but they feel low to me. So I look at a two story building for 30 million. Um, and my memory, I'm trying to think back to Central Park. I was trying to quickly pull up some of the construction costs for Central Park. You're shaking your head up and down. So I'm thinking maybe I'm on something. You could explain it a little further because you also have a smile with that shake up and down. So, Well, I think that um, some of this goes back to these are still really rough estimates. And these at this point are our best guesses as to what it will be. So as we move forward and especially as we see what the construction climate is over the next 12 months we'll be able to come back and really um, almost update some of these construction cost estimates um, but this is more of just an order of magnitude of what how much money we're really kind of talking about okay. so they are still very rough they're just a straight square foot uh, cost estimate by a third-party cost estimator through the architect yeah, do we remember, the reason I'm bringing it up is we've kind of gotten, I, I remember a couple other projects where the numbers came in kind of low and um, it caught us off guard, caused us some challenges. Do we have any, just maybe Mark has an idea of what um, the cost for either that, that two-story building at Central Park for the, the fourth and fifth grade, or if that's not readily available, maybe the cost for the brand new Laurel Woods School? Well, let me... Let me provide maybe a different relevant clarification, and and that would be the new Agnew Elementary. Okay. So, if you look at uh, Agnew Elementary, assuming everything comes in where we think everything finally is going to come in, we're looking at ninety eight million for the new Agnew Elementary. That's all in. If you look at the Phase One A summer work, Phase One A and the summer work, that's twenty two point six million. That's slide fifteen. And then you look at what is on slide 17 of 67.6 million. That rough estimate there tells me, and I'm doing the math in my head, but I think you're somewhere around 89 million, uh, 90 million. And remember that there's some slight differences in that. One is Agnew was constructed before the current 24% increase. I, I think the, let me, let me get this right. 
24.6% increase that we've seen in the last year in construction costs. So Agnew was all pre that. Um, and it was also not, there was, I mean, there was demolition stuff that we had to do on that campus. We would have to do something completely different on this type of a campus. So maybe that is a little bit more of a relevant comparison as to the magnitude of what we'd be looking at here in comparison to a mostly uh, a more recently completed construction of an elementary school, rather than just looking at the last time we constructed just a brand new two-story building. Okay, good. Well, that would obviously be an area of concern, just making sure that when we, as we move forward on this, that we get and you've already brought it up is something you're worried about. Uh, you, you mentioned several times that these are rough, rough, rough numbers and we don't have a good crystal ball on them. So, but that's something that concerns me because I do know that we've gotten into projects in the past where for a variety of reasons, things have gotten tight and we've had to go back out and find new, new funding for it. And that's a very awkward process. Don't want to do that. Thank you. And we've really, um... We've really toyed with this presentation that we are worried about the cost estimates. All, all five of us are worried about the cost estimates. But we also all believe that it's important to be transparent based upon what we are currently seeing. Um, Larry and I had a conversation about you know, the importance of when developing our initial plans, and I wasn't here for them, but Larry was obviously, um, and the importance that when building those plans, we built a plan that had significant fiscal reserves tied to it within Measure BB and using cost inflators that we thought were outrageous at the time. Who would have anticipated that we would have experienced a 24.6% increase in construction costs in a one-year period of time? Um, and Larry, have you never seen anything like this in your career, have you? Well, maybe you have. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't ask a question I don't know the answer to. Um, but it, it is unheard of to have that significant increase in cost estimates. And so when we thought about this presentation, we know the uncomfortableness that there is when talking about that cost, that the current cost estimates are more than what we had set aside for some of these projects. But we also think it's important to point out this is our current known reality. And we also know that when we actually go out to bid on these projects 18 months to two years from now, we will be in a different economic climate. We'll be able to do more of an update at that point in time. So it's better to, we felt it better to share the real information with you as we know it today, recognizing the fact, or as I've said, even on our budget presentations, it's approximately right and exactly wrong every single time. We know that these numbers are going to change, but it is what we know them to be today. Okay, Trustee Fairchild and then Trustee Canova. Uh, thank you so much. So I'm looking at the um, phase 1A parking structure on Westwood and there currently isn't in drop off there, right? Going back to slide 15. There is. We are enlarging it. So this parking lot will be constructed after the existing multi-purpose is demolished. And it will, so right now the upper grades drop off and pick up in that parking lot. Okay, so this is the basis of my question because the when you're when you're talking about moving the existing portables that are in the middle of the campus, those are the preschool SAI portables. And I'm just thinking as a mother, and I'm looking at the current drop off, and you've just tripled the walk with so we're moving the we're, I'll say that we're moving the portables, but those programs may not be in those portables once they're moved. Okay, that that's makes me feel a little better. I hope there is really early communication on that, um, not last minute communication on that, as has been in the past. Trustee Canova, go ahead. You know, and actually, Mark, you kind of triggered some some thinking. You know, if we look at the very last page to this presentation, it says next steps, finalize master plans of phasing free school, final approval of master plans in the December meeting, and then, of course, the final document. 
but but as you stated, as Larry knows, as Andy knows, anyone that's been on the board for a very long time, you know, you, you can have a bond be successful, have those resources in place. Think of the story with the Agnes campus. You know, we had to go to yet another bond to finish that project, you know, especially with respect to the high school. And um, and that's always a problem you face. You know, you, you get that funding at a fixed point in time, but this process of building schools takes a long time. And the economy does things that you just can't predict. You know, there's no way, you, no, no one here has a crystal ball. And so, you know, I think what I'm hearing from you tonight is, you know, here is what, here, here are the resources that we have. The costs have gone up 24% in the last year. And then when you look at these lists of unfunded items, those are very significant lists of unfunded items. So, uh, I, I just think that going forward into the future, I think we're going to have to entertain the notion of a bond, you know, to get all this work done. You know, we've done it before. Uh, other districts have done it. Sometimes that's just a reality. But um, but I, I think that we need to start um, getting our arms around the notion that that's something that we're going to have to think about down the road. But I think it's something we're going to have to entertain. I think it co goes back to what Michelle said at the beginning is, you know, part of this master plan process for all of our school facilities is identifying what it is that we want our school, each one of our schools to look like in the future based upon our future ready and learning environments. So it's not necessarily saying that we're, we're moving forward with all these projects. It, it's more of identifying that if and when funding becomes available, now we have a roadmap of projects that we can say, the planning is already done. Now we're faster move, being able to move forward with the projects. We do have some funding, you know, we have the rest of the Measure BB funds um, that we will be spending on appropriate projects. We have some developer fees and we will be using the developer fees where we legally can spend those. And I use the Bracker project as one potential way we could legally spend those funds, which would then allow us to spend the measure, stretch the measure BB funds further. So one of the things that we are all committed about is looking at existing funding sources first to maximize those before going to where you're saying. Am I saying that I disagree with you. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm trying to say first is, is that we want to maximize our current resources that we have available first, maximize uh, what our taxpayers have already uh, protected us or given to us, use those wisely, and then also continue lobbying at the statewide level. As we've said, we've submitted a significant number of applications, and we're just waiting for state reimbursement. We haven't received a reimbursement in quite some time. We've got the applications waiting up there. What we're waiting for at this time is the next time the state actually goes for a bond measure, and that will put us in line for those funds. Yeah, and if you remember back to when we approved the Measure BB, there was twice as much that we could have gone for than what we actually did. So, and and with cost increases, of even more. Um, Trustee Fairchild, you had another question. Um, yes, I I do. Thank you so much. Um, and I don't want to feel like I'm I'm being negative, but I'm I'm really starting to uh, be a little stressed by by what I'm seeing, and basically by also by what I'm hearing, because while I was actually very concerned, I wasn't on the board at the time when I was in a, when we made our wish list, and one of the things that bothered me is it it was. And everyone has a different process, but each school kind of got to identify what they wanted. And it wasn't based on an identified, we come in, all right, we think each school needs an upgraded kitchen. We think each school needs classrooms. We think each, you know, it was, it was just what the principal thought at the time or the staff at the time thought. Um, so you have, we have three very different plans. We have one where the desires of the staff create a whole entire new school. And then we have another where we have a little bit here and there. That to me doesn't feel like we're, again, looking at the needs, but we're looking at the wish list. And I, I want I want to have our master planning based on equitable needs of each community. 
not that, you know, my, I'm, I'm going to use an outlandish example just because I don't want, I want it, but like, what if a school says, I, we want a, we want a theater where we can watch movies. That's, a, that's our priority for the school. I would like, not that well, that would ever happen, but I want us to think about, okay, what are our parameters for this master planning? This is showing to me exactly why I voted against the master planning, because what we're doing is just creating more wish lists, and I want it to be more equitable. And this, the three plans are so vastly different, I, it doesn't feel equitable. So I will say that um, the three master plans are different because they're also sized for three different sizes of schools. So Bracker is, Bracker would be in a very different, it would have a very different plan if we weren't planning on Bracker expanding and growing. Bracker's plan looks a little bit different and they get a new, they wanted, and that was also mentioned in the Measure BB, a new multipurpose, as well as some of the um, new preschool, new uh, TK, well, they didn't have TK then, but new preschool classrooms. So that was that was mentioned in the bond. Westwood also, those were the items and as well as parking lots. So I would say that we are looking across the three campuses and trying to do what we can with the amount of money that we have to best in enhance those schools. So the next item on Bri on Briarwood's list was an expanded multipurpose with a stage and a new kitchen. But do you understand what I'm what I'm saying? Like I really feel like it needs to be needs based, not want based. And and, and and what I keep hearing is, well, this is what this school school wanted. I want to see what this school need because Bracker's the one that's slated to be the biggest school. Yet it's not the one getting the two modern and modernized two story building. It's it's we're refurbishing those their port their wings. So why can't we refurbish all the wings? Do you see what I'm saying? It just feels very it 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 doesn't feel like we're it feels like we're back to where we're just making wish lists rather than saying what do each of these schools need, not. There's a lot of things I want, but what do we need? Are we have we have taxpayers who have been very generous with us for a lot of years. And we want to make sure that when we're going out to them, it's not with these big grandiose plans, but with things that we need. And this feels too big right now. Brecker has a two-story building. Brecker does have a two-story building at the southern end. Um that is in a future phase. And one of the considerations at Westwood, uh, we did talk a lot with the school site and with the architects, and we had discussions about those two wings that are on the north side. Those classrooms are smaller than 960 square feet. So they were put in, um, they're, they're, they were built smaller and they have an extra HVAC room inside of them. So those classrooms, they don't have great lighting. They are smaller. And some of that is one of the reasons why we opted in the master plan to say that we're going to demolish those two wings and build a new two-story. Could we just in, not do that and modernize them? Absolutely. But one thing that um, we're doing through this district-wide master plan is really working with ed services and saying, how big do those classrooms need? Those are their upper grade classrooms. And as kids get bigger, they get older, they need more space. And having those classrooms be in the 800s is quite a bit smaller for those classes. And that was one of the major considerations in demolishing those two wings and building a two story. I, I'm concerned we're sending an a very interesting message to our com our community. Um, we've gotten emails about these plans just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We're, we have declining enrollment. There's a lot we have to con consider. And I just, there, I, I just want us not to, this not to be a wish list, but an actual needs-based master plan. 
So well, President Muirhead, I just wanted to mention that there are a couple of fairly lengthy uh, comments on the spreadsheet that were submitted through the, through the, um, I know sometimes we forget that the, that's, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one that forgets occasionally that it's out there, but we do have some comments from the public uh, on the uh, written comments on the spreadsheet that I think are important. They're mostly about Westwood. Thank you. And actually, I don't know if, if, if um, Mr. Shields had time to, I just handed him my computer a second ago so he could see what was out there. You're reading very quickly. Well, maybe before we're through, you can give us sort of a address, at least the high points of that, that comment. That was all, thanks. Okay, thank you for that reminder. I'd forgotten about that. Um, so that's good. Um, there, there was a comment about declining enrollment and I noticed that you were master planning Bracker for a much bigger school because of the incoming enrollment there. Um, did you do look? Did you look at enrollment figures for the other two schools, um, Briarwood and Westwood, when you were doing these calculations? So, so you factored in if there's declining enrollment or growing. We did, yeah. We um, said that uh, Westwood would be. We planned Westwood for 400, and that would. Um, we're we're thinking that Westwood will stay around 400, um, with not getting too many new developments in the area and then Briarwood is closer to the 300 mark. Okay. Um, wow, there's a lot of comments. So we'll have to read those on our own afterwards. Okay. Um, Mr. Shield, did you want to give any comment on those if you had a chance to, to look at them? So I am... I the the comments are really long, and to the to respect to the two individuals who submitted the comments, um, I would be I feel like that if I tried to quickly give a response, it would be um, not do the true justice to it. So I'd like to kind of defer on that if at all possible. Sure, I understand. Um, okay, Trustee Canova. Just going to the declining enrollment, and, and we, we've seen it, obviously, particularly coming off COVID, uh, but we also saw trends even before COVID. And, you know, one of those um, issues that we deal with in this valley is, and we see it, other districts have had some really severe um, declines. Um, families can't afford to live here. It, it's just unaffordable. And so the question is, is this a trend that's not going to change? Because if it's a trend that's not going to change, um, then that's that doesn't bode well for our future. I mean, are we going to become an area where it's the haves and the have-nots and families can't afford to be here? If that's the future that we're looking at, um, we won't have students for the districts to uh, educate. Uh, the families will move away. They won't be able to be here. They'll have to be elsewhere. Uh, so I don't have that rim of view of the future. Uh, I believe that there's enough um, will among the um, cities and counties and school districts of the Bay Area to um, do things that allow families to stay here, that allow families to thrive. We'll find a way. I think the economy, you know, we know from experience, it's a roller coaster. And um, so I don't subscribe to the notion that the student decline is an unchanging thing that it's just gonna to continue to go in that route because honestly, if it doesn't change, we can just turn the lights out and close up shop. Uh, I think it, the trend will go back. And so that goes to the notion of a master plan. You know, if, if the trend will come back, it will. It, at some point it will. We do need to have a master plan. So when that time comes, we know where to go. We know what we're gonna do. That gives us the ability to be fast on our feet when that time comes. Uh, this will be in place, ready to go. In the interim, we do what we can, as you've outlined. We do what we're able to do now. <clears throat> and then in the future, as the trend changes, as resources become more available, we have a plan. And I think that's really what we're talking about. The, can the plan be altered? Can the plan be modified? Can the plan be changed? Of course. Uh, this is not written in stone. But, but it's important that we have a plan. So I believe that's what you're saying. Am I correct? Yeah, it is. It I would say it's a good. It, it's 
a good summary of part of what I was saying. Absolutely. And I agree with you that, you know, there's been, and we've talked about this a lot in, in past board meetings that, um, there, there's several studies out there that talk about declining enrollment, not just in Santa Clara County, but throughout the entire state. But, it, you know, a lot of statewide organizations are talking about the declining enrollment in Santa Clara County. I want to be, um, and being one of the five largest declining counties throughout the entire state and far pass, far surpassing what's happening at the state throughout the entire state. And so, it is something that we need to be mindful of and make the appropriate adjustments with that. And then also keep our eye on, as you said, the residential development that's happening and the type of residential development that's happening. If, if the developers are building, and Michelle and I talk about this a lot, if developers are building a lot of, you know, they say, hey, we're building a lot of development and the development's all studios and condos and one bedroom units, we're probably not getting a lot of students out of those types of units. Our student generation factors would say as such. So it's being mindful of what is happening in the development community. And it's not just hearing the glossy numbers that we're doing. We're going to do 10,000 units or 12,000 units. It's the 10 or 12,000 units of what? And then determining the, the impact on that. And then how do we prepare for that in the logical time period? So that is what we're trying to do is um, be prepared for now and also plan for the future in a very judicious way. Thank you for that. That's a that's a good closing. So I see on the um, next steps, finalizing the master plans, we'll see those next meeting, correct? And um, and then uh, you can move forward um, on making more detailed plans, I guess, is the next step, right? Yeah, then uh, we would move forward with um, really fleshing out the phase 1A projects and um, figuring out um, how to move forward and, and working with the school sites to start those designs. And that would be on the bond, the bond office would do that. And then after the, that meeting, uh, the December meeting, you'll also get started on the summer work. So the um, playgrounds have already, we're already, you already approved the architecture contracts for the summer work. So that's okay. already progressing. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate it. And thank you. Um, Marie for joining us tonight. Okay, so we have no um, discussion items or planning items. So the um, next up is items from the board. So we'll start with Trustee Ratterman. Um, I just like to thank the uh, the public for their support over the recent months with the most recent election. And there's a ton of activity out there, but if you want, go look at my Facebook because I don't want to keep us here all night. How about that for short? Mm -hmm. Okay. A few things. Um, no, this is not your final meeting as president. You, this is not your final. You have to. You have to open the next meeting. You, yes, you, I will. The open meeting the next will begin meeting. with you as president. So this is not the last one. I wanted to congratulate both Andy and Vicki on your uh, reelection to the board. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you have watched all the various uh, races around us. My gosh, there are a lot of races that they're still counting because they're so close, um, a lot. So, so you both are very lucky that you're not in that situation where something's so close, where you're waiting for the, uh, every little vote to get counted. But, um, but there's quite a few, uh, uh, Mayor of San Jose, Mayor of Santa Clara, um, SD10 is very close. There's, there's just so many that come to mind that are really close and everyone's kind of sitting at the edge of their seat as the counts still come in. But congratulations to you both. And yes, you will be president at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Trustee Fairchild. Uh, thank you so much. Not a whole lot to update. We've been, Andy and I have been busy with lots of other things. Um, but if you happen, shameless plug, to ha not have plans tomorrow night or Saturday night, um, the community Santa Clara Roberta Jones Junior Theater is putting on Shrek. And uh, the little F young Fiona is pretty cute. Trustee Gonzalez. I just want to mention that uh, 
Metro Ed, it's looking like career technical education is having an open house or tour on the 30th of November. So if you're not at the uh, annual education conference from CS the CSA will be, will be holding in San Diego, it'd be nice if, if any of our group members uh, visit that campus, it'll be a, you know, they have a lot of great programs that, that they'll be uh, showcasing. So that'll be good. And um, they're still working the hours, but it was looking at 12 to two is probably the, uh, the hours of that tour. And um, with that, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. And if you do go to San Diego for the annual conference, I will see you there. Trustee Lieberman, do you have anything you want to report? Um, I don't have anything to report, but I wanted to um, congratulate my colleagues, Trustees Fairchild and uh, Ratterman on their election victories Tuesday night. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that I will get to continue to work with both of you. And congratulations to President Muirhead and Trustee Canova on your victories as well. Even though you didn't have an opponent, you still were, were reelected. So congratulations. And um, I just wanted to um, quickly just say thank you to President Muirhead um, for your leadership the last two years. Um, it, it's been um, it's been a true just joy to work with you um, as our president um, in my first two years on the board. And uh, I can think of no one better to have been our leader through COVID and um, through some of the, the more challenging times in the last couple of years. So thank you so much for, for your service and for all you've done for me as a mentor and friend. Um, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Lieberman. Um, I have a few things going on. First, I want to just say that I've worked out with um, Dr. Waddell that um, trustee and superintendents from around the county have been invited to get a tour of our new site, um, Agnew, Huerta and McDonald. So I'm very excited um, to show off our new innovative schools to other districts um, in our county uh, coming up in December. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. You can come too, if you want, you'll get the invite. Um, it's uh, December 9th in the afternoon, three o'clock on December 9th. Um, you'll get an invite through um, Santa Clara um, County School Board Association in the next, very soon. And then uh, in other news, uh, Santa Clara High School had their 150th anniversary and we had a big celebration. Um, Trustees Fairchild and Ratterman were there with me to celebrate. Um, so that was um, great to see so many alumni, um, quite the competition between Panthers and Bruins. Um, but it was just fun to celebrate. And we had um, Senator Wachowski there and assembly members, uh, Evan Lowe and Alex Lee uh, came to celebrate with us. So it was very nice. On that same day was Santa Clara High's homecoming. So uh, Trustee Ratterman and I, along with other Electeds got to judge floats that morning, and then uh, they had their parade, and I hung out with the kids at Central Park watching the parade, and they learned how to do the wave. It was very cute. Um, we uh, Then I attended the football game, and I helped in the snack shack because that's just fun to do. That same day was Sutterfest, so uh, I think Trustee Radman was there. I, I stopped by for a little bit, and then um, on election day, this was just really cool. I was invited by, there's a political science club at Santa Clara High, and they had also uh, invited another elected official who had to back out, but I was there anyways. And I got to talk to the high school kids in this political science club about how to participate and uh, in uh, the political process and what it means and what it looks like to be an elected official and and all those sorts of things. And they had great questions um, to ask and they were very thoughtful and curious and they have great futures ahead of them. So that was um, very cool to, to spend election day with kids who are not quite voting age, but they will be soon. Okay, on that note, we have our next meeting on December 8th. And then I just wanna point out, we have 
a couple of meetings in January, um, plus our governance retreat on January 31st has been listed on the agenda. So make sure that that's on your calendar, um, board members. That will not be, that January 31st, we will not be streaming that meeting. Um, it'll just be uh, in the boardroom. Okay. Um, it's been a pleasure working with everyone for two years as your board president. I've really enjoyed it. I'll say more words at the next next meeting. Motion to adjourn. Rotterman. Second. Fairchild. Okay. We have a motion from Trustee Rotterman and a second from Trustee Fairchild to adjourn the meeting um, at 941. So, uh, Trustee Canova? Yes, it's roll call. We still have a trustee on the well, line. Can I bring this mic way over here? Your mic. Yes. Thank you. Trustee yes. Fairchild. Trustee Gonzalez. Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Ratterman. Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent. And I say yes, so we are adjourned. Nine.